All right, here we go into chapter 19, Magnetism. Um, frankly, one of the more bizarre and interesting and uh, uh, subject in physics, and it holds some interesting secrets, and um, I hope to share them with you. But I think we're going to start with the basics, um, things that every kid knows, right? And then try to build our way up to a more sophisticated understanding. And I would like to teach you the secret of magnetism, that most people don't know. <laughs> most people who teach teach physics to high school students don't know. There's a, a sort of a dirty secret about magnetism, um, in that in a way it doesn't exist, and I I can I'd like to prove that to you and show it to you and 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 blow your minds with that a little bit. But let's start with what we know. Is I mean, in the other way, it does exist. It's very real. You go to the kitchen, grab one off the refrigerator, and there's a magnet in it, and it freaking works. It sticks to the fridge. The magnets repel each other, and you've, if you have never played with magnets, you have never lived, because <laughs> it's a lot of fun, right? A um, couple things we know about magnets is they have poles, a north pole and a south pole. And every middle school kid knows that, I should hope. Um, if not, let's get together. I have some magnets you can play with. <laughs> um... Uh, like poles repel each other, and unlike poles attract, opposites attract, just like in electricity and magnetism. With electricity attri electricity and magnetism, we had positive charges and negative charges, and now we just have north poles and south poles. Excuse me. Um, so it turns out, unlike uh, magnetic charges, we could have a positive charge and just have it hanging around and move all the negative charges as far away from it as we can. And it turns out with magnetic poles, that doesn't seem to be possible. Um, if you take a permanent magnet and cut it in half, each new piece of the magnet will have a north pole and a south pole. It seems that the north pole is intrinsically linked with the south pole. And when you look at my magnetic fields, it'll be kind of obvious why there are, um, inseparable in North Poles and South Poles in general. Though mathematically there's no reason a magnetic monopole like a North Pole couldn't exist somewhere in space. Um, it would be bizarre mathematically but it could happen. However, we've never seen one and we suspect that none exist um, because of the true nature of magnetism, which I hope to give you a peek at sometime. But we're going to do that in class. Um, so, uh, if you have a piece of iron or a similar metal, what we call a ferrous metal, um, if you put a, a magnet near it, they say stroking a metal, uh, stroking a magnet is like moving it along it, um, there are actually a bunch of ways to magnetize a piece of iron. We'll take a peek at it. You can make a new magnet. Um, a similar thing can be done with charge. Remember we took like a piece of fur on a plastic rod, you can charge that, that thing up by induction. Um, so there's no real conduction for it, though you could touch the magnet to the metal. That, that helps to the proximity matter, so getting it close is good. Um, but magnetism is induced in certain materials. And we'll figure out why. Um, I just want to start with the facts right now, what we know. <clears throat> Once we get to the... So this is the macroscopic view of magnets and how they work. Once we get to the submicroscopic, then eventually we can explain why this happens and why these things work. Um, and that's what's going to make you a cool physics student is knowing how magnetism really works. Um, and I always apologize to anyone who is a juggalo in the audience who does not want to know how magnets work. You can certainly skip this video. I wouldn't want to offend your religious beliefs. But I do intend to teach you how magnets work. Okay. Um, soft magnetic materials, such as iron, they're very easy to magnetize, but they're also very easy to demagnetize. They, they fall apart very quickly. And this is done um, through entropy. Basically, if you hit the material and it causes the, the molecules to vibrate, they become unaligned. So it has to do with the alignments of, of domains of molecules. Um, so if you heat a magnet up, that causes the, the molecules to vibrate and they sort of lose their orientation. A hard magnetic material, very difficult to get magnetized. Usually you have to like do it while it's molten or something like that or give it a crazy high magnetic field. Then it aligns and then um, because those molecules are just stiffer, just harder to move, they keep that new alignment more easily. So that's, that's the first clue that there's something going on at a molecular level, something going on at um, the sub-microscopic level. Right. Um... So maybe gravity produces a gra gravitational field. We certainly think of it that way. And maybe electricity um, or electri uh, electrically charged objects produce an electric field. And we like to think of it that way. And those may or may not be real. Um, we definitely think of magnetic fields and talk about magnetic fields, but they are definitely not real. Um, 
However, mathematically, the, the ideas are very sound, and we, we measure magnetic fields, and we use them, and uh, they're real enough for government work. Okay. Um, so you've got a, a charge is surrounded by an electric field, but a magnetic field um, only surrounds a material that has a uh, that has been magnetized, and not some things can be charged, and some things can be magnetized, and there's not necessarily a re there's a relationship between charge and magnetism, but there's not necessarily in the macroscopic world any connection um, between a charged object and a, and a an object that's been magnetized. Uh, certainly an object can be both, um, or one or the other. Like you don't get an electric shock by touching a magnet normally. Right. All right, so let's talk about mag magnetic fields. Remember, a field is, um, you take a space, some any space you want, a space is just a collection of points that have some sort of spatial relationship to each other, right? So you've got um, all these uh, points in space, x, y, z coordinates, and in those coordinates, you give a value to every point. Um, in this case, the value will be the value of the magnetic field. So now you've got a space, you've got a value at every point, and um, you get a value for the gravitational field, a value for the electric field, a value for the magnetic field, a value for wind speed, temperature, there's all kinds of things. Like the, our universe is just overlaid with all of these uh, bits of information at every point in space. And if you knew every information about every point in space, you could control the universe. <laughs> no, but well, that's really what we're doing, right? But on, on a very limited scale. You want to know what the magnetic field is like? You can measure it. I have really nice sensitive magnetic field um, sensors. Sorry. Um, um, so at every point in space, you've got a vector. Uh, magnetic fields are not a scalar, they're a vector. They point in a certain direction. The symbol we're going to use, we used E for electric fields. We are not using M for magnetic fields, and for the life of me, I do not know why. Um, probably, I, who knows? We use the letter B for historic purposes, <laughs> traditional purposes. Um, the direction is the direction that the north pole of a compass needle would point at. So if you put a compass at that point, the, the, a north, the north pole of your compass... Um, would, would point in that direction. So magnetic field lines are used to show um, how two magnets would react to each other. So um, only the same way charged objects felt forces from other charges, magnetic objects will feel forces from other mag from magnetic fields. Right. So you put a charge in an electric field, it feels a force. You put a magnet in a magnetic field and it feels a force. An object that is not, does not have any magnetic qualities, you put that in a magnetic field, um, probably nothing will happen um, unless it's um, ferrous and then it might itself might become magnetized and then begin to feel a magnetic force. Complicated. We'll get to that. Here's a picture of the thing I said. So if you imagine each of these little red guys as a little compass um, where the, the arrow is pointing in the direction of um, the north pole of your compass would point. So notice it goes from out of the north and into the south. And because there's, you know, you can't get an isolated north pole, it's always going somewhere. It's always curving around from the north to the south. Much like um, electric fields went from the positive to the negative. Though so you could have a positive, and just they went out radially forever. This doesn't happen with magnets. Then there's a uh, south pole somewhere nearby that it's curving towards. So that's how we sketch magnetic fields. Once again, the closer they are together, the more, the stronger the magnetic field is. So it's twice as many lines um, going through a certain point, and you'll have twice as much magnetic field. Right? It'll be twice as strong. Um, the cool thing about magnetic fields is you can actually sort of represent them with a magnet, put a piece of plastic down, and throw some iron filings on top of it, and you can actually see... The, uh, the magnetic field and its shape and strength, right? The stronger places um, hoard a little bit more of the little iron filings. These are just little, some, uh, almost microscopic slivers of iron. Why that happened? Um, iron filings showing magnetic fields. Um, so the, the only problem with the iron filings is that they don't have arrowheads, right? The fact that we're pointing from north to south is arbitrary. We just picked a point, um, and we, we just picked it to match our compass needles because we've been using them for thousands of years, and so it was an easy an easy pick. But north is not north because it's of anything special other than the Earth's north, right? We, we Our magnets pointed, our compasses pointed north, and so we, we called that the North Pole. Um, though 
ironically, our north poles are actually, we actually point towards the south. So the, the Earth's north magnetic pole is actually a south pole. Our compasses point, our north, the north ends of our compasses point towards um, north. That should mess with your head. Okay. Um, bring a north and south together, two different magnets. And notice they're both curving back towards their, the back ends of these things, but they get a very strong magnetic field pointing from the north to the south between those two magnets. Very similar to an electric dipole. Um, so we got two magnets, but it's not exactly the same because each each little magnet has two poles. So it's a, you know, it's a quadrupole, but a, a very similar idea to putting a, a positive and a negative charge, at least in between them, so very similar looking fields, though different kinds of fields. So here's two north poles together. Like if we, if we put two, two um, positive charges together, you get this sort of deflection away from each other. Just to give you some visual sense of what's going on with these magnetic fields. They're normally invisible, and the Iron filings give you a chance to see what they look like. Okay. There's a, um, a pairing of ideas. I'm going to say this many times. I'm going to say it for the first time here, and I'll say it many times. It'll be written on the screen many times. A magnetic field is only created by a moving charge have a charged object and it moves, it will create a magnetic field. The only part, thing that can ever feel a magnetic field is a moving charge. Okay, So moving charges create magnetic fields and moving charges feel magnetic fields and that is the heart of what's going on. Um, so we're going to look at it first. We're going to take a magnetic field created by some magic machine or a magnet and then we're going to run some particles through it and see what happens to them. And then later we're going to go, all right, what if we just move a particle? How does it create a magnetic field? So first, how does a charged particle feel a magnetic field? And then later, how does it create a magnetic field? And then we'll try to link the two, the submicroscopic and the, the macroscopic and, and try to understand how a magnet can exist. How are their charges moving and yet there's no current? Um, in these uh, objects. It's interesting. Alright. <clears throat> so, you get a maximum force when the charged particle is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. When uh, a charged particle moves in the direction of a magnetic field line, you, it feels no force. Only when it's perpendicular. This is backwards. This is opposite of electric stuff. Um, so... Uh, well, actually, it didn't have anything to do with motion with the electric stuff, so I'm, I'm thinking of something else. Um, so when it moves along a field line, it feels zero force. When it moves perpendicular, it feels a maximum. And then there's, obviously, there's going to be some sine or cosine that tells us the amount of, of force in between. I think it's a sign. Um, so we're going to measure the magnetic field in terms of how a test charge feels a force. The same thing we did, that's how we defined the electric field, is we took the force um, that a test particle feels and divided by the charge. Here we're going to um, <clears throat> do something similar. We're going to take a test charge Q, we're going to run it through a magnetic field and measure the force on it, and so we're going to define the, the strength of the magnetic field to be the force that it feels divided by Q, times V times the sine of the angle between them. Between what? Between the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, and V. V is a vector and B is a vector. Force is also a vector, so there's, there's three there. So we're going to actually flip that um, uh, equation around so that we're going to we'll show F. The vector F is B cross... Um, V in terms of direction. So F, the force, is Q, V, B, sine theta. That's the magnitude of it. And then it has a direction. It has a direction that comes from V and B, but is um, perpendicular to both, actually. So we're going to use a cross product. So um, in order to do that, we're going to define a right-hand rule. We've used some right-hand rule stuff in the past, but we're going to have a couple for magnetism. In fact, the magnetism test is always an interesting um, thing to watch because everybody's out there 
using their right hands to try to figure out the directions of things. And a good, a, a large percentage, 40% of something of the test is just figuring out which direction things are going in. Particles are feeling forces, um, magnetic fields. So those magnetic fields have directions, um, forces have directions, and the particles themselves moving have directions. And so we're going to try to sort that all out using a right hand rule. Uh, quickly, the units for magnetic field is something called a Tesla. Um, again, it's just a nickname for some other set of units put together, right? Um, WB is a Weber per meter squared. Um, don't worry about that. Newton per coulomb per meter squared. This is your, your almost broken down. I guess we can break down Newtons again, uh, or Newton per amp meter. Um, you, why, I don't you see you futzing that much. If you know it's a magnetic field, just put it in Teslas, make sure everybody else is in meters and Newtons and seconds and coulombs and that sort of thing. And you should get Teslas out. Um, Tesla's a gigantic magnetic field. You don't want to any, be, be anywhere near a magnetic field that's a Tesla. Um, something like what an MRI machine would generate. Um, so engineers tend to use something called a Gauss. It's just ten to the f uh, ten to the four Gauss as one Tesla. So that's a little, a little more just a more tenable unit. It's a small unit, a more likely unit. A rat. Um, so if you're in a laboratory with a really strong magnet, you might get two point five Teslas. Like that's a, a beast of a magnet. Um, if you have a superconducting magnet, you might get as many as 30 Teslas. So that's um, still very strong magnet. It's not something you want to, uh, you know, bring your metal objects near. The Earth's magnetic field, 10 to the minus 5 Teslas. So very weak. Uh, so I don't know what your average refrigerator magnet would be. Um, remember, um, this field drops off as you go away. It gets weaker and weaker. So if you get really close to the edge of a, a refrigerator magnet, you might... Uh, I might get something like a hundredth of a Tesla or something like that. All right, so the direction of our magnetic field. <coughs> Excuse me, this comes entirely from experiment. This is what we know happens. And then the theory came later. Once we tried to figure out what mag magnetism really was, we use this all the time to... Um, segregate particles, positive particles from negative particles, particles of one mass from another mass. We're going to do this physics and some, the physics of particle accelerators is all about magnetism. We use magnets to move charged particles around um, and manipulate them and it's very cool stuff. All right, so the force is perpendicular to both B and V. So think about it for a moment. B is a vector and V is a vector and they both point in a certain direction, right? Whatever the angle is between them, between B and V, that's going to be the angle that we take the sign of. But whatever that angle is, it forms a plane. Two lines form a plane, regardless of what that plane's orientation is. And so there are two possibilities that are perpendicular to both. So that plane that B and V create, there are two perpendiculars to it. One this way and one that way, right? So we have to figure out which one is which. So the maximum occurs when B and V are perpendicular to each other. When they're parallel to each other, if you let B and V come together, well, then you have a problem. One line doesn't create a plane, and so there's all kinds of perpendicular ones. And actually, it doesn't matter in that situation because there is no force. The force goes down to zero if, they, if B and V are parallel to each other. All right, so we still haven't figured out which way that goes and how we're going to practice it. Um, there's going to be a lot of clicker questions with it. i got to teach you that right-hand rule. That's next. Okay. So, um, the magnetic force is Q, V, B, sine theta. And the order matters. You want to memorize that formula. Q is not a vector, so we don't have to worry about that. V cross B times the sine of the angle between them. Okay? So it's V first and then B. So what you do is you put your hand, your right hand, in the direction of V. Your palm sort of makes up the direction of V. You're pointing your fingers to begin with in the direction of V. When your hand is flat, it's pointing towards V. Then you bend your fingers or curl your fingers in the direction of B. Now, you're going to be like, well, it's the other way, and you don't try to bend your fingers backwards. Instead, flip your hand over. Okay? So is it this way, this way, this way? So you've got 360. You just may need to flip, flip your hand over, right? 
yeah, I think we can do everything from there all the way to there. You can get 360, it's a little bit uncomfortable on some of the angles, but you can orient the paper or rethink things or move your body, <laughs> all right? But it's right hand, it's gotta be a right hand rule. If you use the left hand, you'll get the opposite answer. Um, v cross B and your thumb points in the direction of the force. Obviously this will be easier to teach in person. We'll do some together, okay? V cross B, thumb is the direction of the force. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is for a positive charge. The, you know, if you look at that formula, Q, V, B, sine theta, if Q is negative, then B, and you get the same answer, but then you multiply a vector by a negative one, or, or whatever the negative Q is, and it scales the vector, and then it flips it over, right? So if you always look, if you're, the, the AP loves to throw negative charges on you just to make sure you know that, right? That the force will be in the opposite direction. Now, I suppose you could have a left-hand rule for your negative charges, but um, I've never seen anybody successfully do that. If you're switching back and forth between hands, you're going to get in trouble. So you do the right-hand rule, and then if you have a negative charge, flip your answer over.